No attempt to understand. I have nothing to do with that. Blacks and the media. Tonight on American Perspectives at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. Next, an investigation into the U.S. role in Iranian arms transfers to Croatia and Bosnia. The House Rules Committee met on Wednesday to consider setting up a subcommittee to look into the matter. New York Congressman Gerald Solomon chairs the two-hour hearing. The uh, Rules Committee will come to order, and uh, we are waiting for the uh, ranking minority member, Mr. Hamilton, to arrive. And we'll take just a minute to, uh, to uh, talk about uh, tomorrow morning's schedule. Uh, as you know, the Ryan White Care Reauthorization Act of 1995, and that is uh, the Commerce Report on S-641, uh, received a unanimous consent uh, approval on the floor a few minutes ago, so it is not necessary for us to hold a hearing uh, and put a rule out on it today. Uh, consequently, the only thing on the schedule this afternoon will be uh, HRES 416, Mr. establishing Chairman. a select, com committee, a select subcommittee of the Committee on International Relations to investigate the United States' role in Iranian arms transfers to Croatia and Bosnia. We will only hold the hearing <coughs> this afternoon. Mr. Chairman. And are we going to vote on Ryan White this evening? No. Or? Oh, on the floor? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the, uh, at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and um, I call this to your attention now because there will be no session on the floor tomorrow. However, it will be necessary to conduct a rules committee meeting tomorrow. So I would hope that all of us could, uh, could be present for that meeting. We will meet at 10 o'clock to uh, actually mark up the rule on creating this select committee. Uh, for the hearing we're having this afternoon. And in addition to that, at 11 o'clock, we will hear uh, testimony on H.R. 2974 uh, and H.R. 3120, uh, two judiciary bills. So that uh, I would hope that you all could be Mr. Chairman, for that. Mr. Moakley. Is there any reason why you wouldn't complete this dastardly deed that you're putting upon us tonight? Uh, do it all tonight rather than wait for tomorrow? Uh, I would like to, but you requested me not to, sir. No, I didn't. <laughs> well, you did in that uh, we, you did not oh. want to have the markup on, the, I uh, on this bill. I apologize. And I apologize. Otherwise, it would have been my preference to uh, meet right. this evening and get rid of the whole thing and give I, all of you the tomorrow off. <laughs> actually, the, the, yeah, there was a miscommunication, but it was my fault. You're right. right. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, therefore, the, uh, uh, we will welcome... Uh, Ben Gilman, the chairman of the International Relations Committee, and uh, Lee Hamilton, the uh, ranking member of the uh, uh, International Relations Committee, to testify today. Uh, the matter before us uh, is House Resolution 416, establishing a select committee, select subcommittee of the Committee on International Relations to investigate a United States role in Iranian arms transfers to Croatia and Bosnia. The resolution was introduced on April 29th by the distinguished chairman of the International Relations Committee, Mr. Gilman, and was referred exclusively to this committee as a matter of original jurisdiction. The purpose of the resolution is to permit the Committee on International Relations to create a select subcommittee for the exclusive purpose of investigating what role, if any, the United States government played in the shipment of arms from Iran to Croatia and Bosnia notwithstanding the 1991 United Nations embargo that was in place at the time against such shipments to the former nation of Yugoslavia. The resolution before us is designed to focus in a single unit of this House the primary responsibility for investigating this matter, while permitting cooperation with other committees of jurisdiction, particularly the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence which has, a, uh, as I understand it, a great deal of information on this subject. The resolution is also needed to provide a certain additional authority to the investigative subcommittee to permit it to conduct a thorough yet ex expeditious investigation. Those uh, authorities include the authority to sit and act both within and outside the United States, the ability to sit while the House is in cons uh, considering legislation 
under the five-minute rule, the authority for the chairman of the subcommittee in consultation with the ranking minority member to designate a single member of the subcommittee or staff of the committee to take depositions and affidavits, and the ability to adopt special procedures to protect classified information consistent with those that now apply to the Select Committee on Intelligence. The Select Committee would be limited both as to the scope of its investigation by the terms of this resolution and as to its jurisdiction. The resolution contains a six-month sunset on the Select Committee, by which time it must report its findings and recommendations to the full International Relations uh, Committee. I know it is the hope of the chairman of the full committee and the likely chairman of the subcommittee that it will not take six months to complete this work. But if we place an arbitrary deadline of shorter duration on the subcommittee, it might encourage some to stall through legal means or otherwise beyond a much shorter deadline for making its final report to the full committee. Obviously, if the full committee is to consider an act of the final report, it will have to do so prior to the expected CNEDI adjournment date of this Congress, which in an election year is expected to be sometime in early October. I certainly hope so. I do not want to go to great lengths in describing the events leading up to the need for this investigation. Needless to say, if the administration had adopted the policy that this Congress recommended last year on at least two different occasions to unilaterally lift the embargo, which would have allowed the officially elected democratic government of Bosnia to defend itself, uh, we might have avoided such a backdoor approach by a country we have attempted to isolate. But even more fundamental questions do arise as to the operations of our foreign policy and the administration's obligation to keep Congress fully and currently informed through our appropriate committees. Beyond that, there are serious questions as to whether the administration even attempted to keep those within the administration that are charged by law with overseeing such policies to keep them fully informed. No one questions the need for secrecy regarding certain foreign policy initiatives or actions, certainly not this member of Congress. But over the years, we have constructed certain checks and certain secret activities uh, to ensure that they do not become so secret that the, they end up having adverse and unattended consequences on all overall foreign policy goals and the national interest. I think we can have great confidence in the leadership and the abilities and fairness of the person that is designated to head this select subcommittee, Henry Hyde of Illinois. His foreign policy expertise, his intelligence, and his integrity are beyond reproach. reproach. I know because I happened to serve on that committee with, uh, with Henry for many years. Indeed, I sat right next to him for many years on the Foreign Affairs Committee, now renamed the International Relations Committee, thanks to David Dreyer. Uh, therefore, I'm confident that he will conduct this investigation in a very fair and a very bipartisan manner, and that his ultimate goal is to ferret out the truth, whatever the trail may lead to, and to make sound findings and sound recommendations to the full committee based on the results of that subcommittee's work. I also think it's important to point out that rather than establish a separate select committee, uh, as has sometimes been done in the past over the 18 years that I've served here, this subcommittee will be working as a subunit of the International Relations Committee, ultimately responsible to and reporting to that full committee. Moreover, the resolution does not go as far for uh, as some previous select committees or task force have gone in the past. The chairman of the subcommittee has not been delegated, and this is important, to delegate the authority to authorize subpoenas. They must be voted on by a subcommittee majority, a majority being present. Uh, the subcommittee also does not have authority to report directly to the House, as other select committees have done in the past. Its reports will have to be made to the full committee, subject to its review and approval, before it can be released to the public. So I want to take this opportunity to really commend Chairman Gilman on taking the necessary but balanced and cautious approach uh, to creating a special unit of his committee to conduct a full and completely investigation into the questions raised by the Iranian shipments of arms to Croatia and Bosnia. And I know subcommittee Chairman Hyde will work closely with the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Gilman, and the ranking minority member, Mr. Uh, Hamilton, and, his, um, and to ensure that this investigation is conducted with the greatest of care, 
with thoroughness and fairness to all concerned. So having said that, I'd be glad to yield to my, uh, my ranking member, Mr. Moakley, for any statement he might have. And uh, Mr. Moakley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Whitewater must be coming to an end, and this is Act Two coming up on the boards. I'm very sorry to be sitting here today witnessing this exercise in electoral politics in the hearing room of the House Rules Committee. Up until today, despite our policy disagreements, I believe this committee was acting in good faith that we're acting on legislation and not pure politics. But today's hearing on what I believe will amount to $1.2 million of research for the Dole campaign is most definitely not in the spirit of good faith. And I'm sure we wouldn't be sitting here today if Bob Dole wasn't 22 points behind Bill Clinton. The select committee are suggesting, Mr. Chairman, uh, we create is not only completely unnecessary, but also completely political. The issue that you're suggesting needs investigation. The issue of Iranian arms, shipments to Bosnia and Croatia has been common knowledge uh, to every single member of this House since 1994. And absolutely nobody, nobody objected to those shipments. In fact, in October of that same year, Congress voted to look the other way on enforcing the arms embargo. Furthermore, Mr. Chairman, the Intelligence Oversight Board determined that there was no covert action and no violation of laws. Let me tell you that again. That the Intelligence Oversight Board determined that there was no covert action and no violation of laws. In essence, everybody knew this was happening. No one objected. A majority of the House voted not to enforce sanctions, and no one is accusing the White House of any wrongdoing. So why on earth are we here today to create a whole new expensive committee to investigate nothing at all? Unless there's some new information on this subject about which I'm totally unaware, I would say that this hearing is a completely transparent political maneuver dreamed up by that same leadership that is asking congressional committees to perform opposition research for the Dole campaign. Mr. Chairman, I think that the Republican leadership ought to be ashamed of today's proposal. What they're actually trying to do is spend $1.2 million of taxpayers' money to investigate something that nobody objected to two years ago and to propose the committee make its report only one week, one week before Election Day. You know, all the rocket scientists are out of, out of uh, work today. So I'd like to ask my colleagues if this work really has to be done, which I doubt, why can't one of the existing committees do it? And you and I, Mr. Chairman, know there's a list of congressional committees uh, whose existing structure of this investigation could take place right now. International relations, government reform and oversight, intelligence, national security, just to name a few. So, Mr. Chairman, I would urge my Republican colleagues to come back. Let's do the people's business. Let's drop this political charade. There are a lot more important legislative matters awaiting us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Moakley, just a <coughs> brief response. You know, the, uh, the House of Representatives did on two different occasions uh, pass a resolution requesting a unilateral lifting of the embargo. And what that would have resulted in, it would have meant that the United States government itself or uh, United States uh, in private sector would have been able to furnish, along with other European nations, uh, arms in order to let the duly elected democratic government of Bosnia, uh, the uh, Bosnian government, defend itself. And that was the intent of the resolutions that passed the House. Under no circumstances was it uh, intended to allow uh, military personnel or terrorist personnel from uh, one of the most uh, uh, terrorist nations in the world, Iran, uh, get a foothold in a place called Bosnia, where, uh, where it was so, uh, such a, uh, a complex area now uh, because of all the ethnic uh, differences. And uh, that is what we're after here, is to find out if any laws have been broken. If they haven't been broken, that's fine. Uh, but it's also to, to find out uh, just what uh, and how we let the Iranian presence establish itself in Bosnia. Because that, uh, I'd be glad to yield to my good friend David Dreyer. I thank my friend for yielding, and I'd just like to, to raise one issue that, that you have on this, Mr. Chairman. The argument 
that this somehow is a follow-on. Whitewater may be uh, shifting to the back burner, and so we brought this to the forefront. It was Tony's and my hometown newspaper, the Los Angeles Times, which less than a month ago, on April 5th, actually had the article that has led us to the point where we are today. The headline said, U.S. okay to Iranian arms for Bosnia, officials say. And then it goes on, despite his public opposition lifting embargo, Clinton reportedly let shipments go through. Now, that came to the forefront just a little more than three weeks ago. And so I think that what we're trying to do here is respond as expeditiously as possible to the get to the bottom of what potentially, and we're not saying it is, potentially, based on this report, is a serious problem. Gentleman Neal. Gentleman Neal. Uh, I'd be glad I have the time, and All I'd right. be glad to yield to right. gentlemen. I can show you millions of editorials saying, right. why doesn't the Congress vote on minimum wage? What's your answer to that? I well, mean, we may be. We, it looks like we may be. Well, nothing on the floor today. On you the want other a select committee right? on the minimum wage put yeah. together? Or? It might make more sense. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, <laughs> let's Thank get you, back chairman. to the germaneness of this issue. And uh, I think at this time, we really better call on the uh, chairman of the uh, International Relations Committee. He is one of the most respected members of this body. He was here long before I came and uh, has done just such an outstanding job uh, as chairman of, the, uh, of, the, of that very, very important committee. And uh, Ben Gilman, uh, please feel free to summarize. Your entire statement will appear in the record, and then we'll call on Lee Hamilton to follow you. You Thank have you, the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your kind remarks and my colleagues. I appreciate this opportunity to testify this afternoon on HRES 416, establishing a select subcommittee of the Committee on International Relations to investigate allegations that the Clinton administration acquiesced in the establishment of an Iranian arms pipeline to Croatia and Bosnia in 1994. The outlines of these allegations were confirmed by the Under Secretary of State for Pub Political Affairs in testimony before a committee just this past week. Regrettably, that official was unable to respond to many of our committee's questions. The hearing raised more questions than it answered. But this much we do know, that the president personally approved the decision to permit Iranian arms to flow into Bosnia, that the CIA and other parts of our government were bypassed and kept in the dark. Our allies were uninformed and misled, and the Congress was not informed. The administration even felt compelled to launch an internal investigation to determine if any laws were violated. It reportedly has invoked executive privilege to withhold that report, the report of that investigation, from the Congress. And at least one administration official refused to testify under oath before a Senate committee about that report. We also know that this policy allowed the Iranians to gain a foothold in Europe and the potential launching pad for terrorist operations. <clears throat> this policy has led to the single greatest threat against American troops deployed in and around Bosnia and has stalled the equip and train program that was the linchpin of the administration's strategy for getting our forces out of Bosnia within one year. One of the most troubling dimensions of this episode is that the administration misled the Congress for more than two years about its policy in Bosnia. Throughout that time, along with many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, we were working to end the immoral and counterproductive arms embargo against Bosnia, and many of you were supportive of lifting that embargo. The House and the Senate each have voted twice, in 1994 and again in 1995, to end U.S. participation in an unjust embargo. And we were strongly opposed by the Clinton administration, which argued that it was abs not absolutely necessary to end the arms embargo. The administration also argued that if we did end it, countries like Iran would step in and supply arms to Bosnia. And now the administration defends its actions on the ground that it was absolutely essential to get weapons into Bosnia. That argument implicitly concedes that the administration misled us and the American people during the congressional debates on the arms embargo. Some have argued that the administration merely gave Congress what it wanted, that is, to get the weapons into Bosnia, and they figured out a way how to do it. Now they ask, why are we objecting? 
The historical record shows that this is a specious argument. The administration kept this policy secret for two years in order to deny Congress what we wanted. We wanted to end the U.S. participation in the arms embargo. We wanted the United States firms and the U.S. government to be able to lawfully provide weapons to the Bosnian government so that, gov the, so that government could defend itself against Serbian aggression. We didn't want Iranian arms to flow into Bosnia. Had we known what, that keeping the embargo would create a vacuum that would be filled by the Iranians, oh and filled by them with the active complicity of our own government, I believe that the Congress would have voted overwhelmingly to end the U.S. embargo and would have overridden any veto by President Clinton. The Clinton administration knew that, and that's why they kept this policy secret. It wasn't a policy designed to give Congress what it wanted. It was a policy designed to influence the Congress not to act. As a result, Iranians regrettably now have a foothold in Europe with increased risks to our troops in Bosnia and the likelihood that our troops will not be coming home within a year as promised by President Clinton because of the failure to get the Iranians out of Bosnia. To get to the bottom of this matter, we've introduced HRS 416, the measure before you to establish a special panel to investigate what happened and to report its findings and any recommendations to the Committee on International Relations. The House Administration Committee today approved $995,000 for that effort. Accordingly, Mr. Chairman, I urge the members of your committee to favorably report this measure to the House. And I thank you. <laughs> well, Ben, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Lee Hamilton, if you'd feel free to summarize your statement as well. The entire statement will appear in the record, and we appreciate your being before us today. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify. I really do not see any uh, compelling reason to establish a select committee to investigate this matter. Uh, first of all, I think the basic facts are not in dispute. Um, the Iranian-Bosnian relationship was established, uh, developed right after Bosnia declared independence in 1992. It wasn't the president's action that gave Iran a foothold. They had a foothold uh, uh, long before this action in April of 1994. Uh, it's been widely known by many of us, maybe even all of us, that uh, there was a supply relationship between Iran and Bosnia. That was in the public press in 1994. It was certainly in a number of classified documents that were available to most of us, at least, in the Congress, if not to all of us. Uh, I do not recall any member ever objecting to that fact or protesting those armed shipments. Um, the administration testified last week that they didn't receive a single protest from any member of Congress about the fact that Iranian arms were flowing to to Bosnia. And as I think, Mr. Chairman, you may have pointed out, uh, beginning in October of 94, the Congress itself specifically mandated the President to stop enforcing the arms embargo. That's only a few months after the April date here. Um, I don't think any laws are in dispute here, at least so far as I know at, at this point. I haven't heard any allegations that specific laws were violated. Uh, here, and the President's uh, Intelligence Oversight Board conducted a review and uh, reported that there was no covert action by the administration and no violation of law. Uh, there certainly is a round, uh, a basis for differing with the administration with respect, thank you, with respect to policy. Uh, the President had a tough call here. There isn't any doubt about it. So far as I know, there were three options before the President. Uh, one is he could protest against these arms transfers to Bosnia. Uh, that was at a time when the Serbs were winning the war. Uh, the Bosnians needed help. He didn't want to do that, chose not to do it. Uh, a second option, I think, was to break the UN arms embargo unilaterally. We had a lot of debates about that here. The President made a judgment call there. Uh, didn't want to break it because of the uh, risk of breaking ranks with NATO and uh, other problems, or the President could do nothing, and that's essentially what he did here, uh, told the ambassador to Croatia that we have no instructions. He made a judgment call. 
Uh, I think as events have turned out, it was the right judgment. Uh, the military balance in Bosnia did change. Uh, the Bosnian military did much better. The Croatians defeated the Serb forces. That led to Dayton. Dayton led to peace and all the rest of it, which is known to us now. But you can quarrel about these policy decisions that the president made. There isn't any doubt about that. Um, what strikes me here is that those policy judgments that the president made uh, should be investigated, it seems to me, not by a select committee, but by the regular committees of the Congress. Um, so I have two major reasons why I would oppose the creation of the new select committee. One. It's just not necessary. The issue here seems to me to be principally one of policy. Congress has every right to look into that. You've got plenty of room for dispute about it. But I don't see any reason for a special committee. That's precisely the jurisdiction of the uh, International Relations Committee today and several other committees, the National Security Committee, the Intelligence Committee, and uh, the Government Reform Committee as well, I think, has jurisdiction. And they're ready and involved, they're already involved in uh, reviewing these facts. So uh, establishing a select committee just doesn't seem to me to be called for here. But secondly, even if you disagree with my analysis here and you say that a select committee ought to be established, then I would hope that you would establish a select committee with the exclusive power to investigate. Uh, but that's not what's happening here. What's going to happen is you're going to have an investigation in the Intelligence Committee. The, the National Security Committee is already involved. They've sent, they've sent some inquiries to the administration. Uh, other committees might be involved. Uh, so instead of having a coordinated, synchronized investigation into the facts, you're going to have several different committees in the House. I don't know how many committees in the Senate. Uh, running around looking at this question, and that really does not seem to me to be a very organized uh, uh, way to approach what uh, all of us, I think, would agree are difficult policy questions. Um, beyond that, of course, uh, you, you seek to add another subcommittee. It's going to cost quite a bit of money. Uh, you're going to have to have a staff of about 13 people. Uh, and uh, at a time when I know the leadership wants to reduce the number of committees and the number of subcommittees and, and all the rest of it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may make one request, uh, we are very concerned that in the resolution we have assurances of uh, consultation. Now, uh, I understand this may be a bit of a confused matter. I hope I understand it correctly. I may not. Uh, but my understanding is that the text of HRS 416 is not altogether clear about the subpoena power, for example. Uh, the text of HRS 416 contains two different references to authorizing and authorized subpoenas. The section that addresses authorizing the taking of affidavits and depositions does reference consultation with the minority. A separate section states that authorized subpoenas can be signed by the chairman. Not, not the chairman of the subcommittee, the chairman of the committee. And so I would ask that you review those powers. Uh, Mr. Hyde testified earlier today in the oversight committee that he was uh, quite prepared to act in consultation with us. I appreciated that uh, testimony. And I would hope that the resolution would write in the uh, consultation requirement. I understand you're not going to give us the power to concur with you on these decisions. We're not asking that. But we would like, with respect to the authorizing and issuing of subpoenas, the hiring and compensating of staff, uh, the taking of affidavits and depositions in all of these matters, that the chairman, who I presume will be Mr. Hyde, uh, will consult with the minority on those decisions, and we would feel better if that were written very carefully uh, into the resolution. Uh, to conclude, then, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for listening to me, uh, I, I really do not see a compelling reason here to establish a special panel. I, I don't think this situation is comparable to either Iran-Contra or October Surprise. I can go into that if you're interested in that point. Uh, I, I do think that the existing committee staff structure and uh, under Mr. Gilman's able leadership can handle the policy review, and I don't think we ought to be establishing a new committee. I, I urge you to rethink your approach to this, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify.
<laughs> well, Lee, we, we thank you. And uh, again, you are one of the most respected members of, the, um, of this body on the, on the other side of the aisle. Just a few, uh, few comments uh, concerning the, uh, the subpoenas. And uh, as we uh, develop this legislation, uh, the subpoenas uh, have to be authorized. They are, they are not authorized by a chairman of a committee or a subcommittee. They are authorized by a vote of the, of the subcommittee. So in effect, no consultation is really necessary. That's a part of the uh, you are, in effect, consulting uh, as you prepare to take a vote. Uh, however, uh, we certainly will, uh, we will review that with uh, Congressman Hyde and Congressman Gilman and your staffs uh, to see what, uh, how we might improve, uh, improve it. Um, secondly, we are, we are not uh, establishing a, a uh, special committee or a select committee, which you, uh, those two terms you used uh, several times in your testimony. Uh, we are deliberately uh, establishing another subcommittee of the International Relations Committee. As you know, it was the effort on, uh, of the Republican majority on opening day uh, back in January of 1995 that we were determined to uh, set an example for the rest of the government, uh, that we, uh, we shrink the size and the, uh, and the power of the, uh, of the federal government. Uh, which, and we thought we ought to start with the Congress, and we did by reducing a number of subcommittees and even committees. And uh, uh, now, rather than create a select committee or another special committee, which sometimes uh, seems just to per uh, live on in per per perpetuity, uh, we decided that the best way we'd do would be to just to keep it within your, uh, your committee and uh, create it for a very limited period of time. I, I for one, object to these, uh, these committees or subcommittees or select committees or special committees going on and on and on and on, uh, spending a great deal of the taxpayers' money. Uh, and just lastly, uh, uh, you mentioned that you haven't heard any accusations of any laws that have been broken. And uh, we don't want to make accusations. I mean, after all, uh, you know, we, there's enough uh, criticism of this Congress and uh, of the administration, whoever the president is. And uh, uh, we, we don't like to make those accusations, but we would like to get to the bottom of it. And that really, I think, is the intent of this legislation. Having said all that, Mr. Gilman, did you have any comments before I pass on to others? Just that this will, as you indicated, be a select subcommittee of our Committee on International Relations. Accordingly, it will have the same authority to issue subpoenas as any other subcommittee under the same procedures as set forth in Committee Rules of the House. <coughs> and uh, this, Mr. Chairman, if I might just yes. comment on one other thing. The question was raised by uh, the distinguished ranking member and why couldn't this just be taken care of by the regular committee? Uh, the full International Relations Committee has before it a full legislative and oversight agenda. We expend virtually 99% of our funds in that. And while this select committee will be undertaking its review, our own committee will continue its oversight of Bosnia and other aspects of U.S. policy in the Balkans. The recent revelations of U.S. involvement in the arms transfer to Bosnia will require a comprehensive investigation, a comprehensive review of just what was done, when it was done, how it was done, and why it uh, came about. The full committee quite simply doesn't have the resources to undertake that kind of extensive review of looking into all of the documents that the executive branch may have and all of the events that occurred. Our agenda is comprehensive enough. We have foreign assistance, uh, we have NATO, we have narcotics, international narcotics control, we have Cuban-American relations, Korean nuclear proliferation, China MFN, just to mention terrorism in the Middle East, just to mention a few of the items that encompass all of our work at the present time without taking on this virtually a full-time review of what occurred with regard to Bosnian arms. Well, Mr. Gilman, uh, certainly uh, your committee, uh, with the uh, list of uh, items that you've just uh, read off, you know, every single American citizen, their lives, their economy, and their security are affected uh, by the work that your committee does. And uh, uh, you and the Judiciary Committee and, uh, and this Rules Committee have had our fair work uh, cut out for us for the last couple of years. So we understand your point. Are there questions of the witnesses to, to my left? Mr. Chairman, I have no questions, but I'm 
Mr. Chairman, I have no questions, but I want to commend you, Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. You know, I've been here for a long time. But the, and this is the first time the Republicans have been in charge. But I've heard Mr. Hamilton champion the cause of these select committees over the years. But his judgment is good, and I think the select committee should be, the action of the committee should be completed on time. And I commend that in this member extension is requested will not vote for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this gentleman has a TV show coming up. Mr. Moakley, would you mind if I recognize Mr. Dreyer so that he can leave in just five minutes? Uh, no, no, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. I've got time. No, I want to go leave. No, I, no I, I, I want to hear Joe before I leave. No, actually, Dave Dreyer is one of my favorite people. I hate to see him leave, but I would, I, if that's what he wants to do, yeah, sure, Dave. Is, no, is, is, is that a reflection yeah. on me, Mr. Oh, uh, he's a great. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, David. Mr. Moakley has the floor. Never mind this Alphonse Gaston act. Mr. Moakley has the floor. You can leave. <laughs> actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, did you say that you'd want another subcommittee because you'd need more personnel in order to handle this. Did I get that information, Ben? Your mic isn't on. In order to accomplish uh, what the uh, uh, primary goal of this resolution is, we would need to have personnel who are competent and uh, have the ability and the time to perform the extensive investigation that would be needed. And we don't have that kind of personnel uh, do you have the ability now subject. to go to House uh, to ask for additional resources? I'm sorry. I do you have the ability now to go to the committees and ask for additional resources? I think we'd be uh, limited. Uh, we've already submitted a, a budget at the beginning of the session. Uh, we all, all of our committees are under constraint to live within those budgets, and that's why we are asking for a More select people. committee and uh, to have the kind of resources that we'd want to do in order to uh, uh, present a credible document uh, to the House. Would you agree or would you disagree, Mr. Gilman, that you currently have 50 or 60 people on your committee and you have 60 or 70 people on other committees that are, are study, looking at similar uh, investigations? Isn't that so? If I might uh, remind uh, the uh, uh, chairman, uh, the, uh, the ranking member, that uh, when the House undertook a similar investigation two years ago, a task force was put together, and it came out of our committee at that time, Mr. Hamilton was chairman, and that was a, a task force to review uh, what had occurred in uh, uh, with regard to the Iranian situation and some of the other aspects and a whole... But what uh, was that call? What was the title? The October Surprise. The October Surprise I, I kind of recall that. Uh -huh. And uh, that went on for almost a year and spent four and a half million dollars. Uh -huh. And I don't recall there being any end, uh, any limitation on time. Uh, but again, that came out of our committee and yeah. uh, a, a number of other committees, I think, worked together with our committee. We don't have the resources to do the kind of... Uh, uh, no, I just thought by looking at the... 50 or 60 people on your staff and 60 or 70 people on additional committee staff that are doing similar type uh, investigations, I thought that you would have. But if you say you don't have, fine. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I ask your man's consent to offer uh, this a mem memorandum of proof that the Republican majority has been directed to search its files for evidence of ethical lapses on the part of the Clinton administration. At this point, I also ask your man's unanimous consent to insert in the record articles from the Washington Post and the Washington Times, as well as a mem memorandum from Congressman Walker and Nussel to committee and subcommittee chairmen. These articles in the Washington uh, Post the time, go back in May of 94, talking about Bosnian uh, uh, arms shipments, Iranian arms shipments, and the statement from uh, uh, Walker and uh, Nussel uh, says in effect uh, uh, to all the Republican committee, look, take a look, good look around the committees of fraud, waste, and abuse in the Clinton administration, influence of Washington labor unions, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just dated April 23rd. I have to commend this committee for 
prompt action. It's only yeah. May 1st. Mr. Chairman, may I reserve the right to object on this and just ask uh, my you're, friend? You're supposed to be gone. No, I just want to know. The gentleman yeah, reserves the right to object. So may I just ask a couple of questions on this? First, um, is the word uh, Iran or Bosnia mentioned at all in those pieces that you have referred to here? I just I, No, I, I just say they were the headlines in the newspapers where people said they didn't know anything about this. These are 1994 headlines talking about Iran ships explosive to Bosnian Muslims. Washington Post. Iranian air cargo opens new arms route to Bosnia. The Washington Post. Uh, Gentlemen, I just want to show that these were secrets. I mean, I mean, everybody knew what was going on. That's all. Reserving the right to object, Mr. Blinder. Um, while it is known that. Iran was involved in shipments. Was it known that the president was quietly approving of it, even while he had his people on the floor of the House arguing with the, the resolutions we're passing to open the shipment of arms to Bosnia? I'm sure the president probably acted like many presidents but before. Continuing to reserve the right to object. Do you, do you, was it appropriate for the president to be taking one position with the Congress and another with the Iranians? I have trouble determining this congressman's position without determining the president's position. I can speak be, of my own position. Be patient, and I'll tell you what it is. All right. Mr. Speaker. Uh, without objection, the... Uh, object, Mr. Speaker. No, no, Mr. no. Chairman. With the gentleman with without right. objection. It's, I'd like to see the documents that he's asking. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it's within the gentleman's... Uh, the right just, to offer it. Uh, they're just newspaper articles. Well, what's the first one, the memorandum? The memorandum is signed by uh, Bob Walker. It's, it was sent to every member's office right here. We will... Uh, well, I'll give you the headline. Uh, Mr. All House Full Subcommittee Chairman from Bob Walker and Jim Nussel. Request for information urgent April 23rd, 1996. If the gentleman would not object, we'll have copies made and I'll pass them down to him okay. so that it'll be there when you uh, when your turn comes. Is that all right? I'm sure if you go back to your office, would, uh, find the we just have him. Would uh, somebody, one, one of your staff make a copy? Uh, and we will give them to the recorder. Yes, give them a copy. Right? No, no, all of them. Okay. Uh, copies are being made, and we'll pass them down to uh, my good friend, Mr. McGinnis. Uh, is there Mr. Mr. Dreyer? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, <clears throat> let me say that I appreciate the testimony uh, both of you brought forward. It's uh, It's been very thoughtful, and I will say to my uh, very good friend and former co-chairman of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress with me that uh, the statement of reducing the number of committees and the size of committee yep. staffs and all did not fall on deaf ears. I uh, got that message and, and appreciated having played a role. And it was fascinating to listen, Joe, as you talked about the scores of staff members on these different committees. And I wonder exactly what those numbers were uh, a year and a half ago at this time. Uh, so we'll be maybe looking at uh, Neal, even... Like the the oh, thank you. Really? Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Going back and looking at the uh, at last month's uh, article in the Los Angeles Times on this this whole issue, which uh, has, has brought this question forward of, of exactly, you can't help but think of the question, what did the president know and when did he know it as we look at this, uh, at this, uh, this article and this uh, behavior and the fact that this issue has been in the forefront for a lot of time. But there are a lot of other questions that, that come to one's mind as we look at, the, uh, at, this, at this piece. Uh, was the administration telling the American people and Congress and, and uh, our allies uh, and uh, even most in their own executive branch one thing and then doing another? Uh, did the uh, administration's action actually violate U.S. law? I mean, that's another question that comes forward. Was the, uh, was the U.S. government's role in these arms transfers simply passive, or was it as the Los Angeles Times has, uh, has stated hands-on, those are the words that they actually used, um, which government officials actually knew about the arms transfers, uh, and when did they know that? How extensive was the effort to keep Congress uninformed on the Iranian operations? Why did the Clinton administration allow Iran to extend its influence into Europe after the administration had announced a policy that was designed to isolate Iran? And why would the Clinton administration allow Iran, um, which is designated as a terrorist nation by the State Department, to unilaterally violate the arms embargo after repeatedly ignoring U.S. congressional pleas and directives for the United States to do so. So I think that there are enough questions which have come from the, the work that the full committee has done and the reports that have come forward that lead to uh, the conclusion that uh, a select subcommittee with a date certain and, and frankly many of the constraints 
which the previous Congress has refused to impose on the establishment of other select committees, would be very, very important. And I hope that this could be resolved in, in uh, a period of time that would be much, much shorter than even the six months that we would allow. Mr. Mr. Gilman? Chairman, if I might you respond bet. to Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Gilman. I think the, the very questions that Mr. Dreyer is raising is a basis for our, the need to further pursue this issue and to get some proper responses, not only for the Congress, but for the entire nation. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Hamilton. The Congress is entitled to go into those questions. I think I can answer some of them. I certainly can't answer all of them. Uh, I have no doubt at all that it's a legitimate area for Congress to investigate. Uh, my, my point here is who does the investigating? The questions that you raised, it seems to me, are largely policy questions, maybe exclusively policy questions. That's precisely what the House International Relations Committee is for, uh, to review executive branch uh, uh, foreign policy questions. And uh, if, if we can't do that, then uh, we're not fulfilling our responsibility appropriately. That's my, that's my judgment here. I just don't see the need for a, a special committee to do it. Uh, and I guess that's my concern. Mr. Bielensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In listening carefully to our first couple of witnesses, I must say I find myself concurring completely with uh, Mr. Hamilton's, uh, Mr. Mr. Hamilton's uh, description of the, of, of the issues and, and where we are on them. Uh, those of us on this side, I think, have two overall concerns. The, fa the first is being whether, whether we need to specifically uh, authorize an investigation into this kind of matter. And secondly, if in fact we do, uh, whether it's being proposed that we go about it in a correct way, in, in the best way, best way possible, that is by creating this so-called select uh, uh, subcommittee. And at the outset, if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, I, I always try on, on matters of this sort, as I know some of my colleagues do, when one worries about when, whether one's being political, one, in one's own response to what may or may not be political from, you know, from the other, other side is to, try to, is to try to change your position or put yourself in the position if something had happened the other way around. What I mean to say is, for this, me for this member at least, and I think I'm being straight with myself and therefore with, with you, if a President Dole or a President Bush or a President Reagan uh, had done the same kind of thing as we're talking about now, uh, I think, I, I believe it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm correct in saying that, that this member would have approved, uh, would have felt very uncomfortable if members of his own party were proposing to investigate the matter further in the, in the manner in which, in which you folks are. Uh, I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but it, it, as I said, it, there's, something about, there's something about this whole matter and the way the President handled it, whether we know all the facts or not, uh, which doesn't upset me, you know, I would hope the rest of you, the way some other things by some other presidents and perhaps this president in the past, you know, have, have been handled. It isn't as if he did something outrageously illegal. Uh, it isn't as if he did something terribly stupid um, or wrong, even though, as, as everybody suggested, we, we don't necessarily have to agree with his position. Mr. Mr. Hamilton pointed out quite clearly what, what his alternatives were. I think he did a good job of, of that. I think most of us, many of us, um, including those of us who were urging us to, to raise the embargo, are quite happy to hear that, in effect, it happened without our, without our rubbing our allies and, and, and colleagues' noses in it and, and making for a very difficult problem between ourselves and some other folks with, with whom we, we want to maintain and have succeeded maintaining a, a close and working uh, relationship. This argument about the Iran giving the Iranians access to, to Europe is, if I may say so, nonsense. There are a good many fewer Iranians in Bosnia now than there were two or three years ago. They've been there from the beginning. It has nothing to do with this. In fact, if you want to look at it this way, and my, I would urge my folks on the Republican side to do so, we've saved the American taxpayers a lot of money by letting somebody else provide these things. You guys, quite properly, or we, if the shoe had been on the other foot, probably would have been angry, you know, if we were using U.S. funds covertly to su for, supplying, um, for supplying weapons contrary to a U.N.-imposed uh, embargo. And when, and it also doesn't trouble me, I, I find it amusing, that's perhaps the wrong word, that a couple of our of our friends on, on, the, on the other side are upset that, 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 we're, um, that this was contrary to the terms of the UN embargo. We didn't used to worry too much about the UN. We worried about US interests, what was good for us. 
And uh, I remember our friends quite correctly, I think, often saying, you know, the UN is a nice idea, it doesn't often do an awfully good job. We've got to tend to some of these matters ourselves. And the way in which this president apparently tended to this matter does not offend this member. And I would hope that it doesn't offend the, the, you know, the rest of you that much. I, I still, I mean, the basic question still really is, what, what's the point of all this? What can we possibly find out? Will we find out anything we don't currently know? I suppose one always finds out some additional things. And, and will it matter? And will it lead any of us to, to feel any differently about, about what had, had been done? I, I don't think so. Um, just one or two questions, if I may. I didn't mean to continue on. I'm just sort of thinking out loud. Um, apparently, at least one of the committee, the Intelligence Committee, perhaps others, Mr. Chairman, are, are will be looking into this. I take it they are not asking to hire on additional staff. They're somehow making do, even though they obviously have other have other matters on their agenda, as does as does Mr. Gilman's committee. But they're somehow doing that. So again, even though you make a good point, Ben, I mean, you've obviously got a lot of responsibilities. I'm not sure they're all quite so important immediately as this might be. Um, but other folks are looking into it without additional resources. You know, why can't you? Or in the alternative, will others drop their investigation or they're looking into this if, if you all take over? Will it just be this one sub, uh, select subcommittee looking into it? Do you know? Or will others continue their work? I don't think it's our intention that this select committee be exclusive. Other committees have already started looking to, into various aspects of this issue, but uh, the select committee will be a full-time select committee with the proper resources to undertake a full-scale investigation. Ordinarily, Mr. Chairman, a, a, a special committee, whether you call it a select subcommittee as we do in this instance or something else, is, is, is put together in order to bring, bring folks together from various places, usually from different committees with expertise in an area so they could concentrate on a particular matter. It, it's a, peculiar creature we're creating here, not that one can't do it, nothing in our rules that says we can't, except we have to add another subcommittee to create a special subcommittee, as it were, of a, of a committee that already exists. It seems that a committee could pull together its existing people and, and do the same thing. But one final, one final question, if I may, to anybody who might have the answer. Um, do we know where the $1.2 million will come from that, that, is, that is being requested here? Will, do other House activities, Mr. Chairman, or, or staff or somebody, have to be um, will it have to be cut to pay for this, or are we simply somehow going to find this money and fund it from, from some other source? Does, does anybody know? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, the sum is 995000 that has been approved by the House Administration Committee. So we're simply increasing congressional spending by that amount. I mean, it's not being taken from either your committee's resources or some other committee's resources. Is that correct? I think that the uh, House Administration Committee is, uh, has not made a determination of the uh, source of that funding, but uh, if I recall, the chairman today uh, indicated, the chairman of the House Administration Committee, that there wouldn't be a need for any additional appropriation. Would, uh, would my good friend yield? Oh, of course. Uh, having <laughs> served for many years on, the, uh, on your, uh, your committee, and having been uh, one of the major uh, sponsors of the legislation which rewrote the, uh, the structure of the House committees uh, as a member of the uh, committee, Lee, that you and I served on that, uh, to restructure the Congress, um, it, uh, we actually eliminated two, two subcommittees from your International Relations Committee. Um, having served on that committee, I know what that does to you. That has really put you in somewhat of a bind, knowing all of the work, especially that you've undertaken in the last 18 months. Um, when you consider the, uh, the Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, it's true that they have a lot of work to do. It does not compare on a year-round, month-by-month basis to what you people do on your International Relations Committee. Uh, the same thing holds true with the, uh, with the uh, National Security Committee, uh, whereby they have huge staffs and have uh, uh, a lot of uh, wherewithal to conduct these, uh, these kind of uh, investigations. Uh, but they don't carry the workload that you do on a daily, daily, weekly, monthly basis year-round. Uh, I can understand why you would you would uh, ask for the additional subcommittee since they were deprived of two of them uh, just last year and have really been been put to the test. Okay, but my question remains and I'm not arguing this I'm, <clears throat> I am I am concerned about uh, where the million dollars more or less will come from whether it's going to be taken from somebody else's kitty or or whether we're just spending that money and 
don't quite know at this point where it's coming from. Because, I mean, that's a legitimate concern. We're trying to keep congressional spending down. We've succeeded with a lot of help from you folks, obviously, in doing so. And it may be, you know, as one, one can always make the argument that we do spend still, even though we're, we've been successful over the last two or three years under Democrats and Republicans alike in, in slowly cutting Republican spending um, for, congr for congressional spending. Excuse me. Slowly uh, cutting what? Congressional spending, both by Republicans and, and Democrats. Both, I think both parties have been quite good about that. Uh, nonetheless, we still end up spending a decent amount every year, and it may well be that if we were careful about it, we could squeeze the resources out of existing committees. The gentleman does have a lot of folks working for him without having to spend an additional $950,000 or so. I just thought I'd bring up a, a, a question that our Republican friends would probably bring up if the shoe were on the other foot. Mm -hmm. Mr. Linder. I just have one question, Mr. Chairman. Lee, uh, when we were having the debates on lifting the arms embargo and you were arguing against those resolutions appropriately and, and uh, from your point of view, did you have any idea that the administration was winking at this action? Uh, I knew that uh, arms were being supplied by Iran to Bosnia. I did not know of the president's instruction to the ambas our ambassador to Croatia uh, that he gave. Uh, I, I believe here that the administration should have informed the Congress of, of the President's decision. Um, I don't know of any legal requirement. Uh, in other words, I don't know that the President violated the law. But if you ask me, should he have informed us, I would say yes. Thank you. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I believe in select committees. <laughs> I lost uh -oh. one. <laughs> and uh, I find it interesting that the people that are excluding uh, Congressman Gilman, the people that are asking for the select committee, are the very people three and four years ago that really spoke out against it, especially the leadership of the Republican Party. Uh, Congressman Gingrich said in uh, February of 93, he said, the Congress should start by cutting its own spending. We should eliminate the four unnecessary select committees and save millions. Uh, <coughs> Congressman, <coughs> Congressman DeLay, Congressman Pombo, Congressman Bunny, they all say practically the same thing. I feel it is very important that we cut these committees, as they are in many respects a waste of money and in that their work is duplicated in other committees. If the members of Congress are doing their job and are responsible, we can take care of the problems that, in effect, are under these committees. And just another, this is Congressman Kim. He made these remarks on the floor about select committees. The answer to this gridlock is streamlining the process by eliminating the wasteful, do-nothing select committees and improving the efficiency of the standing committees. Unlike the select committees, which have no legislative power and therefore can actually do nothing, the already existing standing committees can report bills and create problems that offer real solutions. They provide genuine action, not just talk. I know Mr. Gilman was a, a supporter of many select committees. We worked together on many of them. And I think there's a reason for some select committees. And some of them were not very good. They were very inadequate. They spent a lot of money, didn't do a lot. Under this particular situation, I have to agree with Mr. Hamilton. I agree with his comments 100%. But I find it amazing that the very people that yelled the loudest years ago about select committees, your leadership is now the one really promoting and pushing this, uh, this unusual select committee. I call it a select committee. You call it kind of a subcommittee. It really is a select committee. I don't feel that, you know, we have rules here in, in the Rules Committee that it has, a select committee has to meet seven criteria. And I don't believe this committee even meets the seven criteria of what we established many, many years ago. And that would be one question and one thing that I would like to submit for Mr. Gilman if, in fact, we pass this out of committee, that this committee has to meet the guidelines of those questions that all of us had to do when we were uh, heading select committees. So I guess the first question I, I, I would like to ask is that, you know, that we're going to spend $1.2 million over six months. What are you going to spend that money on? 
What kind of salaries are you talking about here? Mr. Gilman, while you're uh, contemplating an answer to that, I would just say to my good friend, uh, Mr. Hall, that uh, the kind of select committees that he's referring to, including his own former select committee on hunger, uh, was established uh, on a temporary basis, uh, as all uh, select committees are, for a six-month period. And it continued on for years and years and years. And no, that's why we re re when we restructured the Congress, we eliminated those select committees and asked that those subject matters be considered within the standing committees of the Congress. Actually, they were, you're wrong about that. They were established yeah. uh, in, for six every, in every Congress for a year. They were established for the year. And uh, the problem and the issue of hunger has never gone away. No. It was a major problem still is today. We still have the same problems. Mr. Chairman, Mr. If I might just respond. Uh, I'm pleased that Mr. Hall raised the issue because both he and I know how important a select committee can be when it focuses its attention and resources on a very important issues such as the Select Committee on Hunger that we both worked on together. Uh, with regard to the budget and how we'll be spending it, we're proposing to have five majority and three minority members, or 38 percent ratio for the minority, same as the minority member ratio of our committee. We plan one contract council for the majority, one contract council for the minority. Combined salary employees plus contract councils total 10 people. Of that number, the minority will have four and a four at a 40 percent ratio. We anticipate that there will be three detailees, probably from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Our request was 1.2 million. It's now been reduced to 995,000 by the House administration. October surprise task force expended 1.3 million. Of that amount, October Surprise expended approximately $1 million for consultant contracts. Our request is $675,000, or about 68% of that expended by the previous investigation. Of the total request of $1.2 million, now reduced to $995,000, $236,000, or 11%, represents costs that were not absorbed in the prior October Surprise investigation or other investigations or committee budgets prior to 1995. That 236000 is now broken down for overtime expenses that we're now required to pay and required to pay for detailees that we were not required to pay in the past. Remaining, remaining expenses would be computer expenses and the usual administrative costs in running any office. Well, I contend, uh, Mr. Chairman, that a million two over six months is a lot of money. We spent three hundred thousand. Nine nine hundred ninety-five thousand dollars. Well, we spent three hundred thousand dollars in that same period for the Select Committee on Hunger. Produced a ton of legislation that is in law today. Received almost every award that you can possibly get in Congress as far as committees doing their job. And we were we had the least expensive select committee on the hill and i you know this is a lot of money to spend in six months and it's 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 very doubtful that you can meet the criteria of this very rules committee as the reason for this because you have the ability to handle this situation among your full standing committee if uh, you know as well as i do that there are some select committees we've had in the past including some we've had and some you've had that haven't been worth anything and i i hope but I feel that this whole idea that you're getting yourself involved in is going to be one of those committees that's going to spend a lot of money. It's not going to go anywhere. Well, I hope that that's not an accurate characterization of the work that will be undertaken by this committee. Uh, I've served on only two select committees, the Hunger Committee with you, Mr. Hall, that you chaired, and the Select Committee on Narcotics, in both of which were highly effective. Just uh, as I yield on to uh, Mrs. Price, I just want to point out that uh, under the uh, rules of the House, it seems to me that the, uh, the criteria in establishing this subcommittee uh, is, uh, has been met. Uh, this, number one, the subject matter uh, and the objectives of the proposed select committees must be clearly defined. Uh, this certainly is. The method of inquiry and expected products of the proposed select committees must be clearly stated. They are. A definite length of time for the proposed select committee to uh, 
to exist must be specified. We do that. Cost factors involved in the creation of a select committee must be outlined. We do that. Uh, I think, uh, certainly, Tony, I think we've met uh, the criteria that uh, has been outlined. Let Mr. me yield Chairman, to Mrs. Price. Uh, just one last thing. Yes. I, I'd like to, I have a statement I'd like to put into the record. Uh, number two, I would like to put uh, uh, the six criteria that you just talked about because the way I count it, uh, I like to, for, for the six criteria, the six questions uh, to be put into the record because um, the final count, the way I look at it, it, there would be three no's, two yeses, and a maybe <laughs> relative to being able to answer these questions as to whether this committee would be useful. Right. Without and, objection. Thank you. Mrs. Price. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to pursue that line of questioning, um, but I guess it's not within the scope of this hearing for me to question Mr. Hall, but you, you helped clear that up. Uh, I'm new to this committee, and I wasn't sure the source of those rules, but uh, I guess you just have some differences in whether those criteria are met. Is that correct, Mr. Hall? Well, gentlemen, um, thank you for being here, and thank you for your testimony. I think um, these allegations uh, encompass the problem of whether the president did indirectly what he would not do directly, and while at the same time deploying American troops to enforce this embargo that he wouldn't live. And I, I think it's, it's a very reasonable, limited, constrained approach. Um, as the chairman just outlined, we have limited uh, this to just eight members. It's uh, limited very specifically to the scope. There's assurances of consultation. Uh, a report is required within six months, at which time there will be a sunset provision. If we continue on, if, if there's a need to continue on, or if you want to continue on, it will require a vote of the House. Um, and it's relegated to subcommittee status. It's not a full-blown committee. I, I think that we're doing this in exactly the right way. And um, uh, one of my questions is, uh, we talked about uh, undermining our relationship with uh, Mr. Billinson, I believe, brought up undermining our relationship with our NATO allies in, in the embargo question. And I don't know with, uh, whether you believe it's within the scope of this committee's investigation to determine whether this backdoor approach has undermined our relationship with our allies or not. I probably don't think that it is, but I think there's certainly some uh, room to, to uh, be concerned about that here, and uh, uh, I believe we'll probably hear more about that in the future. Um, good luck in your endeavors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just have to uh, uh, sit back and wonder uh, at the, the, uh, the questions about how our allies would have reacted had they known. Uh, Mr. Gilman, you know that I traveled with Doug B. Wright, a very valuable member of your, uh, your committee, uh, to a place called Macedonia a number of months ago. And when we visited our troops up on the top of the mountains, and looking over on the other mountain was a whole series of donkeys. There must have been 80 of them, loaded down with barrels of gasoline and oil, going over the mountain and into Serbia. At the same time, we have uh, uh, what was then classified information, which is not classified now, showing barges coming down the Danube and into Serbia and with our allies looking the other way. So let's not worry about what our allies would have thought. We know what they were doing. And I yield to my good friend from Miami, Florida, Mr. diaz Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for Chairman Gilman. If, I'd, if I may, I'd like to preface uh, that question simply by stating that I think that we're, we're embarked upon a very, very serious uh, matter here. Uh, much more serious, I think, than we perhaps even realize at this point. Uh, I, it's true that I disagree with few members uh, in this House as much as I disagree with my friend, Mr. Bielenson. Uh, but uh, certainly, I, if there's a moment when I've disagreed with anyone, I say so with all respect. Uh, it was uh, today when Mr. Bielenson stated that the issue of the establishment of a military presence by Iran in Europe, in his words, was nonsense. Uh, I uh, disagree with all vehemence uh, with that statement. I think that not realizing that a mortal enemy, declared mortal enemy of the United States, Having a military presence in Europe is an issue of concern to the United States 
I certainly disagree with. Um, we twice in this Congress passed legislation, Mr. Chairman, in effect telling the President we will not stand by, we should not stand by while the Holocaust, a Holocaust is occurring in Bosnia uh, and simply look the other way. What I think we meant to say certainly with those pieces of legislation was the President has an obligation, certainly a moral obligation, to try to stop the killing in Bosnia, uh, if need be, by unilaterally ending the arms embargo. But if there's something that I think should be uh, self-evident, is that we, we're not saying that by ending the arms embargo, we should be encouraging either overtly or covertly or explicitly or tacitly permitting a military presence by a terrorist state in, in Europe. Um, I believe that that's something that should, be, should have been uh, self-evident. My good friend, uh, Mr. Hoyer, in a previous committee we met on this and stated that in, in the legislation that we passed, he said, where we sought to end the unilateral arms embargo, unilaterally end the arms embargo, we did not say, well, we don't mean that we don't want, in other words, we didn't, we didn't make clear that we didn't want Iranian arms or other terrorist states' arms in Bosnia. I maintain that we didn't say also that we, did, that we didn't want collaboration with the Ebola virus. There are certain things that should be self-evident. There are Muslim states that are allies of the United States who I think would have been more than willing to try to help uh, solve the problem uh, of uh, arming uh, in Bosnia. And as the chairman has stated, if the embargo would have been lifted unilaterally, there wouldn't have been an issue even that the United States could help directly uh, the Bosnians. So this is a very serious issue. I, I think that one, one thing that impresses me is the certainty as, as to the facts that, have, that I've heard before. Mr. Bielinson, for example, stated, I believe, that he believes that fewer Iranians are in, are in Bosnia now than there were some years ago. That's a fact which certainly would seem difficult to believe. I think we need to investigate it. I certainly do not share his certainty as to that fact. Um, the distinguished uh, ranking member of the International Relations Committee states in his testimony that he's not aware that any laws were broken by the administration. That's certainly something that needs to be looked into. I don't share his certainty. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even share that certainty either because he admitted in the prior committee that he could not guarantee that no, that no laws were violated. So if there's ever an issue that I think that merited a serious investigation in a concentrated fashion by this House, it is this issue. And so that's why I think it's, uh, it should be commended. Uh, the idea should be commended. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Gilman. Ben, it has not been uh, denied that when the CIA, uh, uh, and this has been in the press, when the CIA learned of these activities, the arming of the, uh, the Bosnians by the Iranians, and that we had either, were either we were agreeing to it or had winked or had, uh, again, we'll look into the extent of the American participation, the U.S. administration's participation. But when the CIA learned of this, there, the matter was referred to the administration's Intelligence Oversight Board. And they began an investigation in November of 1994. They state that that administration investigation found no violation of law. Were you, as the chairman of the International Relations Committee, brought into that investigation, advised? Were you part of that investigation? Were you told of the investigation, of the results of the investigation? May you address that? Would you address that? Please? Uh, the answer is simply no. We were not advised. Uh, there was no consultation with our committee, at least through my office. Uh, we did not have uh, any information directly from the administration of what was occurring. And I uh, have been led to believe that neither did the Intelligence Committee uh, have any direct information. And that's a, 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 a portion of what we want to review. Why wasn't there a communication? Why wasn't there a consultation with the Congress with regard to this aspect? You know, when uh, Mr. Galbraith, the ambassador in Croatia, our present ambassador in Croatia, was asked recently by the press uh, 
Were you uh, advised uh, by the administration uh, to give uh, a, uh, a green light to all of the arms embargo? Were you advised to tell people that there was a green light? He said no. Were you advised that there was a red light on all of this? No. And then the New York Times reporter said, well, we have a new foreign policy. It's a lights out policy. Uh, I think it's extremely important that we examine the, the basis of our foreign policy in this area. Uh, if I might just also point out, the gentleman was absolutely correct that Iran is a rogue uh, a government, a, a government that exports terrorism. I'm quoting now from the Global Terrorism Report of 1995 uh, dated April 1996 by the U.S. Department of State, which says Iran remains the premier state sponsor of international <laughs> terrorism and is deeply involved in the planning and execution of terrorist acts both by its own agents and by surrogate groups. This is our own State Department report. It goes on to say Iran also gives varying degrees of assistance to an assortment of radical Islamic and secular groups from North Africa to Central Asia, and then says Iran continued to view the United States as its principal foreign adversary, supporting groups such as Hezbollah that posed a threat to U.S. citizens. U.S. missions and personnel abroad continue to be at risk. The gentleman is absolutely correct that this is a very dangerous aspect of all of this, how Iran has been brought in to the European community and allowed to be a, a portion of the work of Bosnia at the present time. May I respond, uh, Mr. diaz Ballard, please? Certainly. Uh, I think what's missing in this uh, response that the chairman has given here is an appreciation of the, of the difficulty of the decision that the president confronted at the time. His options were very tough. It happens in diplomacy, I think, that you're often faced with very tough options, and none of them are good. I would acknowledge that a downside to the President's decision here, which was a decision uh, to say we have no instructions or, in effect, to do nothing, I would acknowledge that a downsize side of that was to open the door wider for Iran. But you've also got to see the positive side of it. The positive side of it was that you restore the military balance, that you create a military stalemate situation, you prevent the Serbs from taking over, and you create the conditions in which diplomacy can work and did work in Dayton. I, I want to say again, the President's choices here were not good. He could have said publicly, I protest the, the transfer of arms from Iran to Bosnia. At that time, the Bosnians were being outgunned. The Serbs would have continued their march. All of the atrocities would have continued, and you would have not have had the situation for diplomacy. The President could have said, okay, we're going to lift the embargo unilaterally, as many in this room, perhaps you, uh, said that he should do. But he rejected that option for reasons that he made clear, although many people may not accept. And his third option was this one of doing nothing. And I just don't think it puts this kind of a decision in the right context to talk only about Iran. Now, my information with respect to Iran, and this is something that has to be developed as we move along here, but my information is that at the time, in 1993, there were 500 Iranians in Bosnia, to the best of our knowledge. They included Iranian Revolutionary Guard, the best of the Iranian military capabilities. Today, my information is that we have fewer than 50 Iranians uh, in Bosnia. Now, the result looks pretty good to me. We want to get those 50 out? Of course we want to get them out. Are they leaving? We think they are leaving. Uh, so I think some progress has been made and that the policy turned out reasonably well. But my goodness, to, to, to 
portray this decision in, in such stark terms, I think is grossly unfair to the kind of situation that the President confronted at the time he had to make this decision. Well, Mr. Hamilton, you make a, a series of uh, allegations and, and statements that you take for fact. Uh, I do not know for a fact what the President did, said, ordered, or did not do, say, or order. Uh, also, I do not know uh, what the fact is on the ground now, what, what the situation is on the ground with regard to the uh, presence of Iran in Bosnia. If anything, I, I do think you've provided us with further evidence as to the need to investigate the situation I, seriously. I have no quarrel at all with your desire to investigate. You, you, th these are serious, tough calls. The president may not have made the right call here. I think he did, but he may not have, and there's certainly room for disagreement about it. Congress has every right to review that decision. Indeed, I think it does not fulfill its responsibility unless it does review it. That's not the question here. The question is, how do you best do it? And my argument simply is, you're talking about policy here. That's precisely the jurisdiction of the House International Relations Committee. It ought to do it. You don't need the extra committee. Well, we, we it's, it's differ free. on the means, but we agree on the need to investigate, and when I see we and do. when I see that administration officials have, have uh, uh, in in uh, in hearings, and I wasn't a member, I wasn't part of the hearing, but I think the International Relations Committee did hold a hearing, and apparently there was uh, uh, a uh, uh, situation where the an administration official didn't want to answer all the questions. I think that it's more perhaps in policy. It's a, it's a, we're, we have a, a difference here of uh, of. Um, uh, that may, be, that may be more serious and may lead to, I mean, it, it may involve actually facts and the need to get to, uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, to find what actually occurred. So, but I do agree with you in, in that we do have to investigate, and obviously our difference uh, resides principally in the means. Thank you. Mr. McGinnis. Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I would agree with uh, Mr. Diaz, and I agree with Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, by the way, I have a great deal of respect for your capabilities in this arena. And I think that you are correct, that, it, that there is a sense of a need for an investigation out there. The question then, I think, comes down to the management philosophy, and that is, should, it be, should those hearings or that investigation be conducted by the current standing committee? I think in the past, under the Democratic leadership, that committee, uh, committee excuse me, probably could have handled it because of the manpower they had. But I think also that you would discover that when the Republicans took control and changed the management of the House, we found what we believed were many excess layers of bureaucracy. It had been a long, long time since somebody had really done a performance audit uh, in the House. It had been a long time. Well, nobody had ever done a financial audit. As you know, we've discovered two books and a lot of, a lot of management problems. To the credit, I think, of the Republican leadership when they took control of this House is they did reduce committees by 33 percent or that. They did reduce budgets by 33 percent. And it also uh, reduced the staff that, that your committee, that, of which you serve on the ranking committee, has. The question now is, can that staff handle this additional burden of an investigation that we, most of us, acknowledge needs to be undertaken? And I think that the chairman of the committee, whose opinion also I greatly respect, says no. He needs some additional help. He needs some additional staff. Wonderful. It's kind of like a trucking company. When we took over the trucking company, there were 100 trucks. We felt we could do the job. Sometimes we'd need 70 trucks, but most of the time we'd need 65 trucks. So we got rid of all the other trucks down to 65, knowing very well that at some point we may have to go and rent for a temporary period of time enough trucks, five or six trucks, to get us up to 70. And that's what we are here right now. We're asking. We have cut your committee, reduced your committee, along with other committees, including the budget of the chairman of this committee. Thanks we have reduced much. those. <laughs> we've reduced those to a bare minimum, enough to operate, but not enough for some extra fluff. There's not extra space in there or extra available funds. So now we're faced with something we didn't anticipate when we, I say we, the Republican leadership did not anticipate this need. The need exists. We all acknowledge that. And I think we have to assist the committee by allowing them to go ahead with a subcommittee or a select committee and giving them the necessary resources. So I support that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I just want to echo what, what my colleagues have said about 
the seriousness of allowing Iran to gain some sort of military presence in Europe. And I think this is something that we should not, must not underestimate. And I think in the ordinary course of business, this would be something that, that the uh, International Relations Committee could do in, in its, the execution of its regular duties. But I think we have something very unique here. We have substantial questions of fact as to what the president knew, when he knew it, what actions he took with that regard, what he was willing to do with respect to informing the Congress. And I think that those questions are very much outside of the normal course of business of the International Relations Committee. And I think that those are extraordinary circumstances that require an extraordinary amount of time and effort and energy on the part of the staff in a very compressed period of time. Uh, and, and so I think that these are unusual circumstances that call for unusual remedies. And so I, I simply wanted to ask Mr. Gilman if you believe that six months is going to be a long enough period of time to be able to complete the investigation. Well, we would hope that it would be, and we'll make every effort to do that. I know Mr. Hyde, who's going to chair the uh, select committee, will make every effort to bring it within that time frame. If not, we'll have to come back to this committee and ask for additional period of time, but I hope that that's not going to be necessary. Well, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Gilman. I'd I just like to say, Mr. Chairman, I think it's critical that we get the answers to these questions because I think very serious questions have been raised, not just about the White House, not just about their relationship between the executive and the legislative, but now we have to deal with the question of, are the Iranians going to stay out when the United States leaves after our commitment in Bosnia? And there are a host of things that this committee is going to have to deal with as a result of this decision. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would just say to, uh, to both of you that uh, be forewarned, uh, if you need additional time, uh, this committee is going to look very carefully about giving any additional time to this committee. We want the work done within six months. We appreciate, excuse me. No, no, we will mark it up in the Rules Committee tomorrow. It will be on the floor next week. Yes. There are no votes on the floor uh, for the rest of this week. You know that. No, there may be one tonight, but uh, none Thursday or Friday. Gentlemen, we appreciate your coming, and uh, thank you for your indulgence. Next, I'm going to ask uh, the next two to come as a panel, Mr. Hoyer of Maryland and uh, Mr. Skaggs of Colorado. If uh, you gentlemen don't mind, uh, I'm sure that we could, uh, we could expedite matters and, uh, and answer your questions in tandem. Uh, at the same time. <laughs> or at the same time. Mr. Hoyer and Mr. Skaggs. Gentlemen, you uh, both are respected members of this, uh, this House, and uh, we appreciate your uh, sitting through the, uh, the hearing so far. And if you'd feel free to summarize, your entire statement will appear in the record and uh, without objection. Mr. Hoyer, would you like to proceed first since you have the seniority? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to appear with uh, David Skaggs. I appear before you as I believe the president's strongest opponent on the Bosnian policy on my side of the aisle. And as probably Bob Dole's strongest ally on this issue. So I do not appear before you as a partisan on this particular issue. But I want to say that I completely agree with what Tony Bielenson said. And I want to go through some of the facts on this because I've been very involved in this. And I had a lot of conversations with the president in disagreement on this issue. And many of the issues that have, raised, have been raised uh, to support this resolution, I think, uh, are specious. What did he know and when did he know it has been repeated by Chairman Gilman and by many others. We, of course, all know that that phrase was the product of a sleazy criminal enterprise conducted in the course of a political campaign. And the issue became, what did 
President Nixon know, and when did he know it? Why do I reference that? Not to make a partisan attack on it, but to indicate that it is my unfortunate belief that this resolution smells of that intent. And it's unfortunate because it deals with one of the most difficult foreign policy issues that we as a Congress and a nation have dealt with and that the West has dealt with. An issue of great magnitude, and as I said in the House Oversight Committee, involving a conflict that created more refugees than any conflict in the last 50 years of our history since the World War II. 250,000 people at least lost their lives. Ethnic cleansing was rampant. And the West was wringing its hands, not doing anything. I also had the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to travel to Europe very frequently on this issue and contend for the lifting of the arms embargo, which I thought immoral and outrageous in the face of the genocide that was occurring in Bosnia. The Europeans felt very strongly, particularly the English and the French, that their folks would be placed at great risk if the embargo were lifted. I disagreed with them. Not that they would be placed at risk, but that the cost of not imposing that risk on them was the death, starvation, incarceration, raping of women as a policy of war by the Serb aggressors. What did the president have to do in terms of his options? On the one hand, he could have put at risk the NATO alliance. I can tell you, I talked to the English and Brits in a number of different forums in Europe, and they felt very strongly about this. I think they were wrong. I disagreed with them, offered resolutions in opposition to their policy. But the fact of the matter is, not only did we know that Iran was giving arms, in my opinion, most people were happy that the Bosnians were getting arms. And let me read you the language that I think most of us voted for, that were here. In the Defense Authorization Bill of 1994, for fiscal year 95, Public Law 103, 337. No funds appropriated by this. This is if the funding prescriptions came about, and that was uh, if the uh, purpose of uh, trying to lift the arms embargo multilaterally didn't work, which, of course, it never did work. If that occurred, then no funds appropriated by any provision of law may be used for the purpose of participation in support for or assistance to the enforcement of the Bosnia arms embargo by any department, agency, or other entity of the United States, or by any officer or employee of the United States, or member of the armed forces of the United States. In other words, the Congress, 1994, said to the administration, don't use any funds if we don't lift the arms embargo unilaterally, to enforce it ourselves. Why? Because we thought it was wrong. And I voted with all of you on the Republican side. I'm not sure all of my Democratic colleagues voted with me. But I voted together with, in effect, the Dole policy, which was to lift the arms embargo. <coughs> but I want you to know, members of the committee, that I believe there is a difference in having the International Relations Committee do this investigation or having this so-called special task force. Why? The implication is that something wrong was done, because that's usually when we have these special investigatory forces, when we think there was wrongdoing. In point of fact, A, we recognized Bosnia as a sovereign nation. We had no business telling uh, Bosnia who they could get arms from or who they could not get arms from. I want to tell you, Mr. Uh, Ballard, you and I are friends and we serve on uh, committee together. But I think it's specious, again, to allege, as you have and Mr. Dreyer and others have, that this is about the presence of the Iranians on the ground. 
the 500 to 50 that Mr. Hamilton, I don't know either whether that is precisely the figure. But everybody that I talk to indicates the presence is down. I talked to Dr. Selijic, whom you know, Prime Minister of Bosnia, in my office last week. And he told me the same thing. Now, he and Mr. Izabegovic he, he, he told you what? That the Iranian uh, presence was not the problem in Iran. He believes there is a problem, excuse me, in uh, Bosnia of Iranians. He believes there is a problem. And he believes that what's happening, unfortunately, is the radicalization of the Bosnian Muslims because of their fear that they're getting pincered by Croatia and Serbia or Serbska. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I can't imagine Bill Clinton, the President of the United States, with the, this language in place, with his feelings so strongly, as he expressed in 92, didn't act on it strongly after election, that this genocide had to stop and that we had a moral responsibility to assist in stopping it. I can't imagine that it would have called up President Izbegovic and said, if you do not, or called up President Tujman and said, if you do not stop this, I will take some action, even in light of the fact we told him he shouldn't. Because the only reason there is any possibility of a Bosnian state today, multicultural or Muslim, the only reason is because they were able to get arms while the West stood by silently while Bosnia burned. So the implication here, and the reason, Mr. Chairman, and you and I have been allies on this issue, that I oppose this is because the implication is that the President did something wrong. Now, I've been a member of this Congress for some period of time, where the Contras in Nicaragua were felt to be freedom fighters. In my opinion, they were freedom fighters. They were fighting to get rid of a communist dictatorship, an objective that I supported. I didn't support the way we were doing it. But the fact of the matter is, they ultimately succeeded. And the fact of the matter is, many of my friends on your side of the aisle would have been glad for them to get support from many different sources, and in fact went overseas to get that support from other sources, legal and illegal. We know that to be the case. Here, the President, the Los Angeles Times, has the shocking d disclosure that the President knew Iranian arms were going. Mr. Mokley read newspaper articles in 94 saying Iranian arms were going to... How did we think the Bosnians were getting arms? We weren't given them. The Serbs had all the Yugoslav army uh, military might. And the only reason those people survived is because this was not stopped. And I suggest to my friend from Florida that there is no Iranian presence in terms of a bulwark in Europe, as you referred to, Mr. Chairman. I would be concerned about that. I am an enemy of Iran. But let me remind my friends on the Republican side of the aisle that Iran became our uh, enemy, and I forget the phrase you used, I uh, can't remember the phrase you used, as, as our enemy, our opponent. Uh, mortal enemy. Mortal enemy. The regime. It became our mortal enemy. As a result of their incursion into Kuwait, their actions in Kuwait, and the confrontation we had in the Persian Gulf. Why did that occur? Because, as you recall, the ambassador gave the implication, apparently under instructions, or at least without specific instructions, that maybe that was all right to go into Kuwait. You recall that. There was no investigation of that. That was perhaps a mistake. We criticized it. There were discussions. There were hearings in the Foreign Affairs Committee, but there was no investigation of it. It was a mistake. I think President Bush would say, in retrospect, it was a mistake. But the fact of the matter is, we ultimately supported confronting them and still do that. Mr. Chairman, I know I've taken too much time, but this, I think, is a very serious action that this committee takes for any president. Because on the one hand, we say, by legislation supported by the overwhelming majority of us, don't take any action to impose a stopping of arms to the Bosnian people because they need to defend themselves, and we believe in that. And now we come back a year and a half, two years later, and say we're going to investigate the fact that arms did flow. Mr. Chairman, I would hope that uh, 
that we're going to go after one another politically very hard this year. Uh, we understand that. I don't mean you and I personally, but it's the parties. Uh, that we would not pursue this in the context of what is clearly the implication that there's an investigation of wrongdoing. Mr. Hamilton's correct. If there is a policy difference, let our Foreign Affairs Committee uh, or International Relations Committee have that hearing, have that debate, have that discussion. But let's not do it this way, which smacks of uh, politics and partisanship. This should not be an area of politics and partisanship. And that's why I'm pleased to remind you that I was not pursuing politics or partisanship in my opposition to President Clinton's policy and my support of Senator Dole's policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Steny, the, uh, you have about three minutes left. And uh, let me just uh, say, because I want to yield to uh, my friend from Florida, that uh, you made the statement that we had no business telling Bosnia when, uh, uh, who they could get their arms from. And you're absolutely right. We never should have been in that position in the first place. However, uh, we should have been in a position to urge them to get their weapons and their arms from the United States, uh, U.S. firms, and our allies overseas, not from Iran. And if we had, uh, if the president had consulted with us uh, and we had lifted that embargo unilaterally or otherwise, uh, that would have been the case. And really, that's what this is all about. But I agree with you. We should not be making a political issue. Let's just get to the bottom of it and get it over with. Let me yield to my good friend from Florida because I, I don't want that, you to miss I your think, vote. Mr. Chairman, that is the bottom of it. No. And we can, and we can disagree with the president, but right. I think that is the bottom of it. Well, let's find out. And we save nine hundred eighty-five. Mr. Mr. diaz Ballard. Certainly, I will be brief, and I do uh, have to go vote. But uh, I, I will reiterate my... Uh, my friendship and admiration for the for, for the gentleman from Maryland and uh, recognition of his uh, record uh, over the years on this issue of fighting against the Holocaust and in favor of uh, lifting the uh, uh, the uh, arms embargo to the Bosnians. Uh, I think that it's nevertheless very interesting that the Prime Minister admits to you, Mr. Hoyer, that he's concerned about the radicalization uh, issue uh, within his country. Uh, there's a, a very serious issue which I think needs to be delved into as well. Again. I think pointing to the fact that we need to investigate this issue of whether or not there is training by the Iranians of the Bosnians now. So these are issues that are serious. I believe they need to be investigated in this context through this uh, mechanism that we're creating. Uh, we disagree, but that does not uh, lessen my admiration for you. Thank you, gentlemen. thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you. Mr. Skaggs, uh, you've already voted, I take it. And uh, so if you'd feel free to summarize your statement, the entire statement will appear in the record as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, discuss this matter with the committee this afternoon. Thank you for the time. I do not have a prepared statement to insert in the record. Uh, what I would like to do is review, uh, in part as a, uh, a member of the House, in part as a member of the House who also happens to sit on the Intelligence Committee, what seemed to me to be the uh, relevant considerations that the committee should address in dealing with this question. Uh, a first question, it seems to me, is what's going to be discovered by this select subcommittee that we don't already know? And my answer to that is not much, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a moment. The second question, it seems to me, that we might ask is, is anybody else going to be looking into this matter who can find out whatever it is we don't already know? And the answer to that is at least three other committees of the House, including the Select Committee on Intelligence, the National Se Security Committee, and as I understand it, the Government Reform Committee. So it's not as if this isn't going to be examined, I think, very, very thoroughly by several different committees and subcommittees of the House. I think in view of that, we then have to ask for an explanation for doing uh, what is proposed by this resolution, namely to give further inquiry into this, the exaggerated status uh, of being conducted by a special select committee. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on what the motives may be for that, but I think it's a legitimate question to raise. Why give this matter this kind of profile, given what we already know, what, we, what little we don't know, and the fact that other committees of the Congress are going to be looking into it. And I think with that context, we would be well advised to calibrate our use of words to the reality that is actually faced. 
Now, I understand uh, that there is a good deal of concern about the wisdom of the President's decision to give the no instructions instruction to Ambassador Galbraith. Uh, I would, if I were a member of the opposition party, want to look into that. I would want to have one of my own trusted members of the opposition examine what has happened. And one has. Warren Rudman, a distinguished former Republican member of the United States Senate, a distinguished former Republican member, I believe perhaps even chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, a current sitting member of the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, has examined the investigation conducted by the President's investigation, Intelligence Oversight Board and has given it his stamp of approval. That seems to me should suggest a cautionary tenor to the vehemence with which we pursue establishing a special select investigative committee. Now let me just mention a couple of other things that I think bear on this. Uh, as has already, I think, been testified to by Mr. Hamilton, unclassified intelligence information establish that as early as 1993, before the events in question, there were well over 500 Iranians present in Bosnia, members of the Revolutionary Guard, intelligence officials, diplomatic personnel, and so forth. Uh, that between 94 and 95, that number varied slightly, but was somewhat under 500. As of the first of the year, it was under 100 this year, and it is now substantially below that. So to bootstrap ourselves into suggesting that what happened in the spring of 1994 was the cause for either allowing Iran to uh, extend its influence in Europe, to quote one of the members of the committee, or to establish its presence in Europe, simply misstates what are known to be the facts and grossly exaggerates the significance and implications of the President's no-action decision uh, in the spring of 1994. I think it is further important to know that there was information about foreign arms in Bosnia uh, in the possession of Committee of Congress, available to members of Congress with clearance, including all of the leadership prior to that time. Uh, what we are dealing with, Mr. Chairman, I believe is, uh, is this, a multiple bootstrapping of both logic and semantics from something that is serious but relatively modest in its scope in terms of having any implications of executive wrongdoing, much less illegality. We start with what are the undisputed facts that the President of the United States, through appropriate channels, sent to his ambassador in Croatia instructions to give no instructions, to say nothing to the Croatian government with respect to the question that they had raised with us about arms shipments uh, to Bosnia from Iran. In other words, the United States government, by direction of the President of the United States, said that with respect to country A's inquiry about whether its position, what its position should be with respect to country B sending arms to country C. Now, to derive from that the suggestion that our fingerprints are all over Iranian arms shipments to Bosnia, I think, is startling. Uh, what we have is an exchange of diplomatic statements. There was no U.S. action. That was the finding of the Intelligence Oversight Board, which Senator Warren Rudman, a Republican distinguished former member of the United States Senate, has said makes sense to him given his review of that investigation. But from that, we first call it an acquiescence. Then we call that action. Then we call that complicity, and then we elevate that and call it deceit. Uh, this is a kind of rhetorical inflation, I think, that does not serve well 
the serious purposes of this body, it really gives innuendo a bad name. If we had a Federal Reserve Board for language inflation, they would be all over us on this for risking the uh, s stability of the currency. And it is an important stability to maintain. Our ability to use language in ways that are meaningful, precise, and sober in something as significant as this particular matter is. Thank you very much. Well, David, thank you uh, for coming before us. Uh, actually, uh, I guess what this boils down to is that uh, the two areas that you mentioned, uh, the fact that no instructions uh, uh, were given to Ambassador Galbraith or uh, instructions to turn the other way, uh, while at the same time uh, uh, not informing our CIA, CIA to me, uh, uh, both of those increased the Iranian presence in Bosnia, and I think increasing the Iranian presence anywhere in Europe or anywhere else in the world, uh, I think is extremely dangerous to the uh, to the United States. So let's get on with it. Let's see what uh, what the uh, again, Mr. Chairman. The uh, facts are to the contrary that this did not well, increase the Iranian in presence your, in Bosnia. In your opinion, no, and in, in, in and declassified and, and, intelligence information about the relative strength of an Iranian well, presence in Bosnia before and after this. Well, I would just say to the gentleman, I think he's wrong. I think that from the information that I've received, the the presence is there. It's there today, and uh, even worse. Uh, the very fact that it was offered in the first place uh, gives uh, uh, more uh, credence to the, uh, the people in Bosnia about having appreciated the fact that the Iranians came to their aid. That is bad. And, and I do not dispute the fact that I do not want Iranian presence outside of Iran, and I'd like the presence inside of Iran to look a lot different than it does. But it is, again, very important not to misunderstand what happened when and what could have caused what. And that, I'm afraid, is well, the fundamental mischaracterization that underlies this resolution. Well, next time, you and I should try even harder uh, to uh, make sure that uh, this sort of foreign policy is uh, corrected, that we never should have put the embargo in in the first place. If we had not, I think things would be a lot different today. Mr. Uh, McGinnis. Mr. Uh, David, um, I, you know, I'm, I've heard both sides of the testimony on uh, how many people from the Iranian government and all this about. Now, the figures you give, I'm sure, are official figures from somewhere. They are unclassified data from the National Security Council. Unclassified. That's correct. Available to everybody. That's correct. So that there's no disputing these figures. Well, I, I suppose some can always dispute any intelligence but estimate, but those are but, the But these are official data, figures. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, I would think that that those figures could be put to bed once and for all once they're made available to whoever wants to see them. Would seem so to me, Mr. Buckley. <laughs> okay. I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Any further questions of the witness? Mrs. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not to belabor this issue of the, the size of the Iranian presence, but let's not make the mistake of equating the Iranian presence with how many Iranians are actually physically in the country at any given moment. Were I an Iranian terrorist and seeing what is officially over 30,000 U.S. troops, and we all know unofficially is at least twice that. If I were seeing that many people uh, from my sworn enemy arriving in the neighborhood, this might be a good time for me to decide to go make some trouble somewhere else, pending the pullout of the U.S. troops, which this administration had said would be within a year. So the fact that there might not be as many people physically within the boundaries of the country now as there was two years ago, I think in no way can be determinate of the amount of influence that the Iranian government will now have with the Bosnians. The weaponry that they left behind is certainly a physical reminder of the influence that they will be able to wield. And so I think we need to stay away from making uh, gross overgeneralizations by saying that because there are fewer people there now physically, somehow the Iranian presence has, has been watered down. And I think it's important that we get to the bottom of what is really happening in Bosnia, what the Iranian involvement has been, is now, and make some projections about what it will be in the future. And I think that's a very appropriate use of the, the powers that we're talking about granting today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I respond, Mr. Chairman? Certainly, go ahead. No, I, I don't have any quarrel with that at all, Ms. Green. I think uh, it is a very serious matter. Uh, the, the current state of affairs as far as Iranian presence, what influence uh, will continue on because of what has occurred in the past. 
Uh, that's also something that the Intelligence Committee, as well as the uh, Committee on International Affairs, can look into. The point that I'm trying to make is that it is offered up by the proponents of this resolution to create a special select investigative committee. It is offered up that a primary reason for this is because the president's instruction of no instructions in the spring of 1994 caused, was the occasion for, resulted in a substantial increase in the Iranian presence in Bosnia. The facts are absolutely contrary to establishing that cause and effect relationship. So if you're hanging your hat on an allegation that something that President Clinton did that spring caused either the establishment or the increase of an Iranian presence in Bosnia, that simply is not true. It doesn't counter the fact that we should be seriously concerned about the present Iranian presence in Bosnia. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I may, with, with all due respect, Mr. Skaggs, I think you're still making the same error. If you say there's no cause and effect because of what the president did, we don't know at this point the full impact of what the Iranian presence is in Bosnia. It's something that we need to determine. Now, ordinarily, without this action of the president, we would, it would be a part of the regular course of business for the International Affairs Committee to make this kind of determination. But we have the extraordinary circumstances here of a president taking one position publicly, doing something entirely different privately. There are substantial questions of fact as to what he was willing to tell, not just the Congress, but even members of his own administration. And that, I don't think anyone can argue, goes beyond the pale of the normal course of business of the International Relations Committee. Thank you, Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman. Uh, we had promised that this meeting would be over at 6 o'clock, and we, we must end it now. David, we appreciate your coming before may us. May I just have one more word, Mr. Chairman? No, you may not. I'm sorry. We, we have to end the meeting. But uh, let me, uh, the hearing is over on this matter. Let me inform the, uh, the members that the committee will remind Remind members of the committee that we have to, uh, we have reached the 6 p.m. advisory deadline for filing amendments to this particular bill, uh, so we, that we can proceed with an informed markup tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., which we will do. Following that markup, we will then uh, meet at 11 a.m. to grant two rules on the Judiciary Committee crime bills. Members are asked to be promptly uh, here at 10 a.m. because we, <clears throat> since there are no votes, <clears throat> many members uh, want to be able to catch planes at a reasonable hour and we would hope to be over by 12 o'clock with the actions of this committee. We appreciate your coming, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. We'll see you all tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. All right. Committee members held a markup session on the bill on Thursday and plan to send it to the House floor next week. The Senate Thursday passed an illegal